what we believe about the deepest parts of ourselves has a profound impact on our relationship to both dreams and sleep. So if we open to that and we, we open to our dream lives, um, we, 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 we step into this sort of collaborative communication with the dream world, uh, it will irrevocably change our lives. It changes everything. We begin to recognize that there is a profound, uh, beautiful, sometimes frightening order inside of us. What may look like strange and and um, fantastic and chaotic and nightmarish, that there's there's an order behind that and it's speaking to us. And if we're willing to step into a dialogue with that part of ourselves and others, it changes our lives. It changes our view of life in a very profound way. What is and what is not true? Those who know themselves being better every single day. Well, good day to you and welcome back to another episode of the Think Grow podcast, where personal development meets real life. I'm your host, Ruben Chavez, and I explore a variety of topics with thought leaders, creators, scientists, researchers, artists, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of interesting people with the ultimate goal to bring you different perspectives you can use to enrich your mind and improve your life in whatever way you see fit. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Ruben Nyman. Dr. Nyman is a psychologist. He has his PhD in clinical psychology. And he is the sleep and dream specialist at the University of Arizona's Center for Integrative Medicine. Dr. Nyman has become a leader in the development of integrative approaches to sleep health by merging scientific approaches with psychological and spiritual approaches. So not something that's often done in the field. Dr. Nyman has worked with a diverse range of people from Fortune 500 CEOs to world-class athletes, from homemakers to politicians to entertainers, and the list goes on. He's also helped to develop various sleep products, and he's provided consultation to a lot of different organizations ranging from yoga ashrams to world-renowned rock bands. And so he's just been immersed in this field of sleep and dream research for the past 20 years. So I had a blast talking to him. I think it was a really interesting conversation and I was just fascinated by a lot of the things that he had to say about sleep and dreams and the effect that those things have on our lives, not just from a physical health standpoint, but also from a psychological and even a spiritual perspective. And he also just unpacks what sleep is from a philosophical perspective. You know, like what is sleep and how, what's the best way to conceptualize it? How is that state of consciousness different from our waking state of consciousness? And all these nerdy questions. Something I realize is that I really love talking with academics. And in this way, actually, the conversation I had with Dr. Nyman is very similar to the one I had with Donald Hoffman on this podcast. Donald is a cognitive sci- scientist, and we talk about the nature of reality. So if you liked this episode, or if you like this episode, you will like uh, the episode with Donald Hoffman, and I think that's number four. Anyway, I hope to have more of these kind of conversations on this podcast going forward. But anyway, without further ado, I bring you Dr. Ruben Nyman. Dr. Nyman, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, Ruben. Thanks for inviting me. Good to have you. Good to have you. So I am excited to talk about this idea of sleep and dreams because it's not something that we've really covered on our show thus far, but uh, you are a sleep and dream specialist, so I thought I'd invite you on. I Just to kind of give some background and context for people, how did you come to, to study sleep and and what is it about the subject that interests you so much? Well, you know, I think in, in various ways, we're all fundamentally interested in life. You know, here we are, we're alive. 
Uh, we're, we're, we're doing things. We have challenges, inspirations. Um, we have tragedies and, and successes and joys. I think when we step back, um, you know, in many traditions, life itself is compared to a tree. Uh, we talk about the tree of life, its complex branches. And if life is a tree, then sleep and dreams are, are the roots of the tree of daily life. You know, when we look at a tree, uh, it's marvelous. It goes through changes, through seasons. Sometimes it buds, it greens, uh, it grows, it gives us shade. But we often forget that, that there is, is as much tree underground as there is above ground. The root systems typically match in terms of pattern and size. And it's like that with sleep and dreams. There's a whole uh, underbelly, if you will. There's a whole underside to life. And we don't recognize that. We, we, we know that the tree needs roots, but we think the roots stabilize and deliver nourishment. But there's so much more that goes on. Trees actually communicate with one another in a forest through their root system. And um, I think there's a similar, there's a parallel in the world of sleep and dreams. There's much more going on in that world than most of us recognize. And so that was kind of what initially drew you to this field is, is just the idea that there's so much there that you want to discover kind of what that is. In part, you know, I, I um, when I was quite young, in my teen years, um, I got very interested in consciousness. It was the era of the late 60s, and there was a lot of curiosity and experimentation. There was a new wave of um, um, teachings coming in from the East. You know, it was the early days of yoga and meditation. And, of course, it was there was an era of uh, psychedelic experimentation. So everything was blown open, and everything we thought, uh, well, we realized things were not as they seemed. And um, so there was a, for me, my interest in sleep and dreams originally stemmed from an interest in consciousness. I also had a, a very personal um, uh, interest in this around my parents. Both my parents were Holocaust survivors. And um, interestingly, they I discovered this as, as I got older and went into training as a psychologist. I was kind of baffled by them because... Um, they, they were both um, significantly injured by the war. They had a lot of loss. They were both in concentration camps. What blew me away as I started to study psychology was that, that they didn't seem to have post-traumatic nightmares. They, were, they had PTSD, but they slept incredibly well. Now, I, didn't, I have nothing to compare to as a kid, but as I got older again and studied psychology and, and stress and PTSD, I thought there's something wrong here. You know, why are my parents sleeping well? It turned out that they just loved sleep. And and um, so, you know, when I was a little boy, um, my mother would play this game with me. Uh, she'd ask me, what's the most important thing in life? And, uh, you know, she played the game over and over again, as we do with kids. And I, I knew what she was looking for, you know, in terms of an answer. But, uh, you know, I'm five, six, seven years old. And, of course, the most important thing in life is toys, right? And she'd say, no, no, no. And then she'd say, I'd say, well, well, then cartoons, of course. And she'd say, no, and ice cream. And I went on and on. And I didn't want to give her the answer she wanted because it made no sense. And she would say, no, the most important thing in life is, is sleep. It made no sense to me until, uh, again, I got older and, I began to piece together the story of her life. And, you know, she was 14 years old and ushered into a Nazi concentration camp. It made sense to me that sleep was her only escape, her only solace, you know. And I think it's true for a lot of people uh, on, in very difficult circumstances that if we have a good relationship with sleep, um, it actually it brings a daily experience of relief of healing of soothing and so both my parents they, they never, you know my father wouldn't sit me on his lap and say son sleep is great he never said that but his behavior reflected that i mean he was a very patient man but uh he would get um uh, he could get really riled if anybody disturbed anybody else's sleep sleep was like sacred even if you bothered the dog when the dog was sleeping, it would it would disturb my father. So I grew up with this sense that there was something mysterious and something of great value in sleep. Not just sleep as something you have to do, you know, to have energy during the day, 
but but sleep is an end in and of itself. Yeah, and, and you talk about sleep as being something just on on its own being important, and not as in relation to waking life. And and that's something that really caught my attention about your work is that you bring forth this terminology wake centric and I'd never heard that before. Can you talk a little bit about what that means wake centric and how we're living in a wake centric world? Yeah, yeah, the the term is a term that I made up a few years ago. And um, I, I originally studied anthropology, and, and of course, in, in, in doing so, we learn about um, people being ethnocentric, or early anthropologists, and, and many people still are ethnocentric. And what that means is that we think that our um, personal cultures, our situation, are, are the norm, you know, the way we live, the way we speak. Uh, the artifacts we have. And we used to go into other cultures and say, oh my God, their language is so strange and their their ways, their habits, their practices, their foods. Uh, we would judge others in terms of our culture until we began to realize there are many, many different cultures and none of them are right or wrong. Well, we have, we're, we're kind of um, uh, ethnocentric around consciousness so, you know, years ago, decades ago, people believed planet Earth was the center of the universe. And uh, it created a lot of conflict when science, early scientists began to say, well, you know, we're just one planet among many, 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 many in, in, in our world. Uh, we're not the center of the universe. Um, we live in a world today where we believe waking, what you and I and what listeners are doing, we believe waking is the center of consciousness, that this is what it means. When people are not conscious, we say, hey, man, you're asleep, you know, wake up or come to. Uh, again, the presumption is that waking is the center of consciousness. When we look at sleep research, all sleep research does essentially the same thing. We turn to sleep and we say, hey, yo, sleep, what can you do for us as waking people? How can you sleep serve waking how can you make us better at waking? And sleep is quite affirmative about that. You know, it answers in the affirmative. It says, I will make you healthier and happier. I'll make you more productive. You'll be better at athletics, better in all kinds of performance. I'll improve your immune system. Um, so sleep makes a, a, a very critical, positive contribution to waking. But we assume that the only reason sleep is there is to serve waking. Uh, and that's wake centrism. So if we were not wake centric, we would realize that waking is only one form of consciousness, that there's something else that goes on um, at night. It's most evident when we dream. Um, part of wake centrism is rooted in, in a false belief that science and culture has perpetuated. And the belief is that sleep is unconsciousness. We all, we all believe that. We've learned that when we're asleep, we're unconscious. In fact, sleep is a synonym for unconsciousness. We believe, in fact, in, in sleep, sleep specialists have written that it's impossible to be conscious of sleep. And it's just not true. And, and I say that not as a personal belief, but as a scientific statement. Um, we can actually learn to be aware of sleep is being aware of something that is so incredibly serene. It's so peaceful that it's hard to wrap words around it. Um, there's an old Beatles song that I love called Golden Slumbers. It's a lullaby. It's written about 300 years ago, and then the Beatles refashioned it. Paul McCartney found it. But uh, the people in my era know the song. And uh, it, the lyrics go, once there was a way to get back home, once there was a way to get back home where it's sleep, and it talks about sleep not as unconsciousness, uh, not as the lack of waking, but as something that actually is an end in and of itself. Now, if you ask most people what is sleep, um, they'll tell you what it's not. And even, even sleep scientists do this. You know, when we try to define sleep, well, it's not waking. It's not consciousness. It's not awareness. And, and uh, in sleep science, the term we use, the technical term we use to define true sleep, stage sleep, delta sleep, we say it's non-REM. So what is sleep? Uh, it's not dreaming. 
And it's an interesting way. We call this is called the negative definition. You define something by what it's not. And it's it's seductive. It's like, oh, yeah, we know what sleep is. It's not this and it's not that. <laughs> it's kind of a but lazy way to go about it. It's lazy and it doesn't work. And, and it, it creates a, an illusion that we know and we don't. Mostly when you read about sleep scientifically, you, you end up not with uh, an explanation of what sleep is, but you end up with um, a description of what goes on in the body and the brain during sleep. Uh, and there's a lot that goes on, and it's interesting and it's useful, but you know what? It's not sleep. The brain doesn't sleep. The body doesn't sleep. We do. Sleep is a personal experience. Um, so it, it, we're left with the question of what is sleep? And um, I think the answer to that, part of the answer is that sleep it is not the lack of awareness or the lack of waking. It's a different kind of awareness. Uh, sleep is the default in consciousness. In other words, um, when you remove waking, um, sleep is there. It's like when you remove the clouds, it's always sunny. Even on a cloudy day, the sun shines behind the clouds. There is a part of us that is always asleep. Even right now, as we're awake and talking, sleep is in the background. You know, this idea that I have to go to sleep suggests that sleep is somewhere else right now. I can go to the bedroom and I can go to bed. Uh, but the truth is, I can't go to sleep. And the belief, this idea that I can go to sleep actually creates a lot of problems. It makes people think that they can use the waking mind to get to sleep. And um, it's like trying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can't do that. The way to get to sleep is to let go of waking. So sleep is always there. It's a gift. It's grace. It's always there for everybody. But if we believe waking is the primary consciousness, we get stuck in it. In fact, I'll just say, I'll add this. I, I think that, you know, what we call insomnia, which is the, the main sleep problem, is, you know, tens of millions of Americans who struggle with trouble falling asleep and staying asleep and getting quality sleep. Insomnia, bottom line, is it is an addiction to waking. That's an interesting way to look at that. What I was going to ask you is that what is the main reason to making these distinctions, you know, between a wake-centric view of the world and and not, and making these distinctions between different types of consciousness. And it seems like one of the benefits is that, well, what you just said, like we can recognize that we can't do everything through our waking consciousness. Would you say that's accurate? Yes, ab absolutely. A and uh, if we're going to consider that sleep and sleep and dreaming give us something uh, above and beyond <clears throat> excuse me, that they give us something above and beyond their contribution to waking, that then we need to look more deeply into the experience of sleep. You know, what actually happens? What's it like? I'll tell you, you know, if you are, or if you know people who are truly good sleepers, uh, they'll all tell you the same thing. And, and I've, I've talked to people all over the world about this. Um, good sleepers will tell you that they and this is the phrase they use, they love sleep. They really love sleep. And people who have insomnia, um, they think that's just kind of weird because they just assume sleep is unconsciousness. But good sleepers tend to develop um, a relationship with sleep, this kind of awareness of sleep around its edges. They love the experience of falling asleep, of drifting, and they kind of stay with it. It's like learning to dive and really, really being with the sense of, you know, bouncing off the diving board and floating through the air and entering the water. But there is a joy in it. There really is. And there's a joy in the deep experience of it, too. We have, we have data now. We, we've, we have research that shows that you can actually be uh, asleep and aware at the same time. Uh, there's a kind of yoga called Yoga Nidra, which is yoga of sleep. And scientists have used EEG brainwave measures to look at people in yoga nidra, and they can be awake. In fact, there's one man who's actually able to go into delta sleep, which is the deepest brainwave indicator of sleep. Uh, he's able to do this and open his eyes at the same time. So he's there. He is what we might call awake, but he's in deep sleep at the same time. Is, is this anything like lucid dreaming? 
there's a slight relationship. Let's come back to that. It's more like it's more like really deep meditation. Your meditation takes you to a point where there's no longer any thinking. There's no longer the typical characteristics of waking, which is primarily thinking. It's as if there's nothing there. But, you know, the, the word nothing is... Um, yeah, I grew up in Brooklyn. And, you know, when I was a kid, the worst thing you could call somebody was nothing. It's like, hey, man, you're nothing, you know. But um, nothing is something. There, there, there's what we call nothing is actually filled with spaciousness, with with uh, a kind of serenity, a kind of peace. There's just no objects there. There's no ideas there. But there is some there. You know, it's not a, it's not thi- it's no thingness, but it's something of value. So good sleepers appreciate that because it, it's it's an experience of uh, profound peace and joy. Yeah, I have always been a, a really good sleeper. I've never really had any trouble sleeping knock on wood and i've fallen to sleep very easily my my entire life i've honestly never given it much thought until until recently when i started looking into the subject and but my father for example is the opposite and he he just he just cannot sleep and he wakes up five six times a night and that that's really troubling to me because you know we're now realizing and have for some years now the immense um, negative effects of a lack of sleep. And so like, is, is there any, I, I know you work with, with people to, you know, to help them improve their sleep and, and different things like this. W- what are some of the integrative approaches that you've used to, um, or you can recommend to help people improve their quality of sleep? So the first thing, um, we'll use your father as an example here because it, it's a common experience. So th- there's a belief again, that sleep is unconsciousness and that any consciousness I might have at night, any any degree of awareness or waking is a bad sign. It is normal to wake up four or five times a night. I'll say that again. It's normal to wake up four or five times a night. What's not normal is not being able to get back to sleep. We all do. Um, you know, every time you kind of turn in bed and, and you, you know, you pull the covers or fluff the pillow or they're, they're between sleep cycles, and we sleep in cycles that run an average of about 90 minutes, and there's a micro-awakening, and most of us forget it immediately. But, you know, some of us remember we just kind of wake up, we turn, and go right back to sleep. So it's not the, not the awakening, per se, that's a problem. It's the belief that I shouldn't have any awakening at night, and if I have any awakening, oh my God, this is a terrible sign, I have insomnia. As soon as people start thinking that, They create anxiety. That anxiety keeps them awake, and it's a vicious cycle. So the first step is to really get that it's normal to wake up, not to fight it. You know, people people wake up and they curse their awakening. Damn, I'm awake. It's a terrible thing. I can't believe this. You know, it's the worst thing in the world because it's just going to get you more aroused and anxious. Um, And you know, you get your dukes up, and you're going to fight to get back to sleep. Well, that you know that pulls us deeper and deeper into waking. So, number one, uh, we have to stop judging awakening. There's actually strong um, research, uh, historical research, that shows that before the Industrial Revolution, people routinely woke up for an hour or two in the middle of the night. It was normal. Virtually everybody did it. People talked about their first sleep, and they talked about their second sleep, and in the middle. They had something they called night watch. This was common language. People would say, hey, what did you do for night watch last night? So people would wake up. You know, sometimes you get up and you make a sandwich. Couples would make love in the middle of the night. Often they would talk about their dreams. They would pray. Uh, It was not uncommon if you're up for night watch, you would light a candle and put a candle in your window. And your neighbors would sometimes come over and literally get into bed with you, which is yeah, it's kind of re- reminiscent of California in the 70s, but it, it had a had a very different feeling. Um, there was a you know, this, this notion of nightlife is so interesting today. Nightlife for many people is about you know breaking away from the day and staying up really late, and for many people it's about you know getting stoned or getting drunk and getting wild. It's it's a rebellion. Nightlife had a really different feeling in those days. Not that people didn't party, but they did it earlier because, you know, you had candles and you just, there just wasn't enough light to stay up late into the night. 
it's interesting. There's, there's something normal and natural about having some aware and awake time in night. It's having a relationship with night. And m- many of us know from maybe being camping or other experiences, there's something just gorgeous, exquisite about the middle of the night. I, I live in a small town. I live in Tubac, which is about a thousand people. And the night sky here is indescribable. Uh, there's just virtually no city lights. And so uh, it's easier to have a relationship with that magnificence. But being up at night in and of itself is, is normal. It may well be that some of the, some of the insomnia we diagnose today is really this natural tendency to wake up at night. The, and, and that's happening now in, in an unwelcomed world. You know, we have this crazy belief <clears throat> and we, we impose it on our children the day that they're born. You know, we want them to sleep through the night. This idea that, you know, you turn off a light switch and you want it off the whole night. The first step in, in an integrative approach is to recognize that it's normal to be up at night. That's a really useful mindset shift, I think, because I'd never even thought of that. Because you're right, I I actually do get up um or I, I wake up at least two to three times a night and it, it doesn't bother me at all. But I, I think you're right about that, that it's it's not that, it's the fact that you get upset about it. Because I've never gotten upset about that, but I know that my my dad does and he, he does get upset about it. And I think what you're describing is what he experiences. He gets pulled into waking consciousness because of that anxiety. There's, there's a great clip um, from this, this old comedy team, the Three Stooges. Um, they, they were popular when I was a kid. But, but uh, there, there's a scene that repeats in, in, in a number of their, their shows. Um, there's three, you know, there's three guys, Mo, Larry, and Curly, and Mo is the dominant one. And uh, the, in, the, in this scene, the, the three of them are, are sharing a bed, these three big guys in a double bed. Mo's in the middle. And he's kind of fighting with Larry. Larry, you know, and they're arguing about something. And he slaps him and says, go to sleep. He turns over and he looks at his other brother. They're all brothers. He looks at Curly and Curly is asleep. Curly is snoring. So Mo does something really interesting. He shakes him and he says, hey, you, wake up and go to sleep. <laughs> and it's it's a really interesting notion because you can't go to sleep unless you're awake. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so you're asleep. You can't go to sleep. And and so this is it's it's strange, but many of us do that when we get a little bit awake. It's like we're swimming. We're swimming in a beautiful pond or a lake or a river, and we come up from underwater. Uh, it's like we come up from the waters of sleep, and we think, "Oh my God, I'm awake." It's, and then it's like instead of just bobbing back down, we swim to the shoreline. We feel like we have to get out of the water. We have to wake up, step into the dry land awaking before we can jump back into sleep. And it's silly because when we wake up at night, uh, even if we're awake, we're probably 25 or 30 percent awake. We're still a major proportion of sleep. And we fail to recognize that because we think sleep is unconscious. Yeah. Well, this also sheds some light on a question I was going to ask you. I'm, I'm about to have a baby any day now. In fact, we're on baby watch. And so I'm, I'm, think, I'm thinking about uh, the loss of sleep that's associated with having an infant. And, and I was kind of uh, prematurely stressing about it. Like, oh man, I got to, you know, cause I got to get my sleep. And so I'm like, man, what am I going to do? How am I going to mitigate this, this lack of sleep? I'm thinking evolutionarily, like it's hard for me to imagine that nature would want us to be unfocused and tired while caring for an infant. So I, I, I think that, well, and you can tell me if, if I'm right about this, but it, it sounds like the waking up in the middle of the night to care for an infant probably isn't the the isn't what's going to make you tired. It's going to what's going to make you tired is stressing about it and you know having that anxiety about getting back to sleep. Well, absolutely, but but there, there's a difference here between when you say you know, talk about nature's impact on us. Um, so so there's a really critical difference in what nature expects from you and what nature will expect from your wife. Um, <laughs> So, so here, here's what we know. Uh, th- there's a there's a common cultural belief that, um, in, in fact, uh, pregnancy and uh, uh, periods of early childhood child rearing are are uh, detrimental to sleep. You know, and uh, I don't know if you've heard this or your wife has experienced this, but a, a lot of women and a lot of physicians 
will convey that that this is going to be a really rough time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and you know you're going to be a zombie. You're going to lose sleep. Everybody tells well, us this. <laughs> yeah, and and that that creates anxiety, and yeah. that's terrible. Yeah. So so number one, historically, uh, we lived in extended families, and so there there were others. There were more others. There, you know, there were uncles and aunts and grandmothers, and there were other people around to help care for a new child. But but the reality is, women are are genetically, they're biologically programmed to receive significantly more deep sleep than men. Mother nature is compensated and it is normal. It's absolutely normal to be sleepy and kind of be in a, you know, if you're sleepy and groggy and you got to get your butt out of bed and the alarm is off because you got to get up and get going and get to work. And, you know, that's, that's a terrible feeling. But if you're sleepy and it's okay and you can linger in bed and you can breastfeed your baby and you can nap with your baby and you got support. You know, sleepiness is not in and of itself is not bad. In fact, it's um, women can naturally go into kind of a sleepy, dreamy state. They do sleep less deeply when they're with their baby. And there, there's a natural inclination for a new mother to tune into her child. And I'm a believer in keeping the baby very nearby. Uh, you'll hear a lot of arguments that it increases the risk for, for a sudden infant death for SIDS. But, you know, that's only true if there are drugs, uh, alcohol, even nicotine, uh, marijuana involved. But otherwise, it's really safe. And there are, there are newfangled notions that, can, that attach to the mattress. There's something natural and lovely about a mom staying not just physically, but psychologically and spiritually connected to her baby. So I, I actually think women women need to change their expectations and they need to know that their bodies, their brains, their genetics uh, ha have um, anticipated this and that it's normal to be in this sort of groggy state with the baby for a stretch of time, not to be frightened about it. And by the way, we, we many of us believe that the reason women on average live longer than men is because they're endowed with this extra deep sleep. Wow, that's fascinating. So they're they're biologically equipped to deal with sleep loss a little better, and, and also they're they're they have a tendency to get deeper sleep. Yes. Wow, that's fascinating. Now, now, by the way, you you don't, you and I don't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and um, you know, it, it it may be strange that men men discover that they have nipples, but they're not terribly useful. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Particularly when you have a baby and. and uh, so uh, there, there are differences. And, it, you know, in the long run, and this may sound sexist, but it's not, but it, it's better, generally speaking, it's better for her to get up with the baby. I'm not saying always uniformly, but generally speaking, she's equipped for it. And, and of course, you know, we, we have all kinds of cultural factors that impact on that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm really glad you touched on what I think is termed co-sleeping because, and I don't want to belabor this point because, you know, I know you're not a baby expert necessarily, but I, I thought that was interesting because my intuitive feeling about bringing baby home and, and, and uh, kind of setting up his sleep situation was that he should be with us in bed. And yes. there's, there's all these, there's all these uh, kind of fear mongering uh, you know, advice that you can read on the internet and elsewhere that's like, oh, you shouldn't do that. But like you said, that is really due to the fact that there's people who, you know, who drink and who can't control themselves in, in, in the middle of the night. Maybe they don't, they don't wake themselves up if they roll over or whatever it is. And so we're really not in that demographic, but, but yeah, just intuitively, I felt like, why would I, you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking of my, you know, paleolithic ancestors or whatever, you know, I can't imagine that they would give birth and then put their baby in a separate chamber in the cave or something, you know, like they would be right snuggled up with, right, right. with the parents. Right. Yeah. You, you go, you go out looking for, a, you go out looking for right. a bigger cave when the baby Right, right. I mean, that, that would be a danger to the uh, infant, I, w I would think. So. Yeah. And the child, the child has been totally enveloped in utero. It's been surrounded by, by its mother. You know, and to pop out, it, it really needs that closeness. There's no question. As does the mother. That, that that early bonding is so important. And it can happen. You know, this is, again, this is our wake centrism. We believe that we have to be awake, sharp, focused, kind of caffeinated, 
you know, of thinking productive and intentional. And, and really, um, to be with an infant, you can enter where the infant is. And the infant is half asleep all the time. And it's fine to bond at that level. It doesn't require sharp wakefulness for a mother to be connected with her child. On this show, I often focus on the mental and emotional aspects of living well. But physical health is just as important. You can't think, grow, or prosper to the fullest unless you have your health in check. Four Sigmatic products have really helped me with this part of my life. There are very few companies whose products I recommend without reservation, but Four Sigmatic is definitely one of them. I've been using their superfood supplements for years, long before they became a sponsor of this podcast. Four Sigmatic specializes in mushroom-based drinks that promote immunity, energy, longevity, and just help us live all around healthier lives. As far as what I'd recommend, they make a wide variety of different blends, but there's two that I'll recommend to you. The first is their Coffee with Cordyceps blend. Cordyceps is a medicinal mushroom and it's been shown to support energy, stamina, and athletic performance. So it's perfect before a workout or during a study session or anytime you need some extra focus. And all their coffee is 100% organic and it actually tastes like coffee, not like mushrooms in case you were worried. The second product I'll recommend is probably my favorite supplement I've taken in a very long time. It's not a coffee blend, it's actually a blend of 10 different adaptogenic herbs. What are adaptogenic herbs? In a nutshell, they are plants that have been traditionally consumed, often for thousands of years, to help people adapt to various forms of stress. They help minimize fatigue, promote focus, and just increase general well-being. So I've been mixing this blend into my morning smoothies for a while now, and I've been amazed by how balanced it makes me feel. Cognitively, I'm sharper, I can work for longer periods of time, and I just generally have more energy. As a listener of the Thing Grow podcast, you can get 15% off any Four Sigmatic purchase by going to foursigmatic.com slash TGP. They've also been kind enough to set up a discount code for you guys. So just type in the letters TGP, as in Think, Grow, Prosper, at checkout, and you'll get 15% off your order. So again, that URL you want to visit for the discount is foursigmatic.com, all spelled out, slash TGP. Or just use discount code TGP at checkout to get 15% off your order. And now, back to the show. So I want to um, get into switch gears just a, a little bit and and talk about dreaming because I know that's something that you focus on a lot and you have some really interesting perspectives on that. I, I guess I, I kind of want to open it up by just asking you a, a question that you probably get a lot, which is, you know, what is dreaming? And I'd like you to give kind of a clinical definition and then I know you have a more holistic or more philosophical definition, I would say. So can you talk about that? Yeah. And and I, I, let me just underscore what you're saying. I think this is really important. I, I published a paper recently with the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences entitled Dreamless, the Silent Epidemic of REM Sleep Loss. And it's really clear that we are at least as dream deprived as we are sleep deprived. And, and our wake centrism doesn't just um, warp our belief about what sleep is, it, it absolutely warps our beliefs about dreaming too. Uh, you know, we see, we see sleeping and dreaming, which are the two other states of consciousness in addition to waking. We see them as secondary and subservient to waking. And that, again, that's that wake centrism. You know, asking what dreaming is is a little bit like asking what waking is. It's a kind of consciousness. I've come to believe um, that that waking is actually a subset of dreaming. I, I would make the argument, and it's complicated, that we actually dream all the time. We become much more aware of our dreams when we're asleep, and in particular when we're in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. But there's evident, evidence that there's a dream-like stream, a dream-like flow of consciousness that goes on all the time. <sighs> what is dreaming? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know. 
I, I believe it, it's on a continuum. Um, I think sleep is the foundation, the bedrock of consciousness. When we come up from there, we come from sleep to dreams, and then we come from dreams when they get more focused and tighter, we come into waking consciousness. So there's a continuity when when uh, consciousness is channeled through the body when it's contained and constrained in the physical body uh, we call it waking when we go to sleep at night we close our eyes we actually cut out sensory input we stop we stop seeing hearing um, to some degree we stop smelling things and so uh, th there's nothing coming in to us from the world when we're in sleep and when we dream on top of that we l literally lose our capacity to move it's called sleep paralysis so in a sense dreaming is an out-of-body experience when we dream consciousness you know the consciousness we have now that is contained and channeled in our bodies through sensory input and motor output it's freed up we are we are no longer in the body and it makes sense then that we could do the strangest things we could move through time we could fly we could be other people because uh, we're no longer consciousness is no longer limited by the body it's an out-of-body experience so dreaming does that i think consciousness um, has trouble being cooped up in a body 24-7. It's like wearing a, a pair of really tight shoes, you know? It's like you just want to take them off at some point. So again, in, in a metaphoric sense, we take the body off. We get an out-of-body experience. Dreaming in that sense, depending on, on you know, various frameworks, dreaming is a spiritual experience. Uh, some people call dreaming the language of God. And it's an experience that frightens most people. Uh, you know, just to, to weave it back to sleep for a moment, we're talking about what interferes with sleep and integrative approaches. I, I think the single most critical, most important overlooked reason that we have insomnia is that we're afraid of our dreams. Um, I, I call this onirophobia. It's a fear. We're, we're, we're not just afraid of dreams. Dreaming is, is an expression of the unconscious. And the unconscious doesn't have a lot of room to, to emerge when we're waking. We're so busy and so focused. But the unconscious comes up at night. And we live in a world that is afraid of the unconscious. In, in many religious traditions, there is a, a longstanding belief that the unconscious is susceptible to demonic influences. You know, the, you know the old phrase, beat the devil out of? That actually came out of child-rearing texts from centuries ago. The belief was you had to beat the devil out of your kids, that the devil was inside of our children. They were born with some kind of original sin. Um, and, and even in more modern pseudoscientific terms, you know, Freud talked about uh, three parts of the self, the, the superego, the ego, the id. The, the id, most people don't understand, the id was demonic. The id is this animal impulse. In fact, Freud didn't even use the word id. He, and he wrote in German, he called it das S, which actually means the it. Freud called the deepest part of the human psyche of consciousness, he called it it, because there's a vast repository of repugnant impulses, you know, terrible shit that we wanted to do to other people. And so, and these are just two examples of this unconscious belief that the unconscious is dangerous. When we go to sleep, we open up to the unconscious. And we need to, we need to come to terms with that, you know, whether or not we're going to trust it. We don't in our world. We really believe that we have to dominate the body and consciousness and direct it. And it's, again, it's a reflection of these old beliefs that what is deepest inside of us can't be trusted. Um, years ago, the psychologist Abe Maslow gave us a whole other way of looking at the depth of the unconscious. Instead of thinking of it as the devil or, or the id, he called it the inner child. He put this whole new spin on it that it was innocent and it was beautiful and filled with great potential. And um, how we look, what we believe about the deepest parts of ourselves has a profound impact on our relationship to both dreams and sleep. So if we open to that and we, we open to our dream lives, um, we, 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 we step into this sort of collaborative communication with the dream world, uh, it will irrevocably change our lives. It changes everything. We begin to recognize that there is a profound, uh, beautiful, sometimes frightening order inside of us, what may look like strange and 
and um, fantastic and chaotic and nightmarish, that there's there's an order behind that and it's speaking to us. And if we're willing to step into a dialogue with that part of ourselves and others, it changes our lives, it changes our view of life in a very profound way. Well, what are some of those ways? Is this kind of a spiritual practice? Are there kind of things that are related to health that are related to um, dreams that, that benefit us? Yeah, but both. You know, from a health standpoint, um, dreaming is profoundly important. What goes on when we dream is interesting. Um, in fact, you know, in recent years, there's been reference to the the gut, the the digestive system as, as the second brain. Yeah. Uh, part of this came with the discovery that that uh, the neurotransmitters that mediate brain function are actually found in the stomach and in the intestines, which is a surprise. But if you step back, you realize your your gut, our digestive systems, have to make very informed and intelligent decisions because we send all kinds of strange, we swallow all kinds of stuff, <laughs> we send stuff down there, and and. Your gut has to decide, okay, are we going to keep this or are we going to just kind of shuttle it out of here uh, in, in much more complex ways? So digestion is about making a decision about what, what we, what the belly will keep and make a part of us and use as energy and, and what it will let go of, what it will literally excrete. If the gut is a second brain in digestion, the brain operates as a second gut when we dream. And what I mean by that is, is during waking life, we are exposed to literally billions of bits of information, much of it unconscious, but we experience things. We see things. We see people. We have conversations. We have feelings. We have sensations. We, we look out. We see nature. There's all of this stuff coming at us. And a lot of it is innocuous, you know, um, looking up in the sky and seeing a blue sky or clouds. You know, that's not going to shake us. That's very familiar. But if we're driving down the street and we see an auto accident and somebody is hurt, that needs to be digested. So what happens at night when we dream is is experiences we've been exposed to during the day get digested. Some of it goes down easy, like water. Some of it, which is troubling, needs to be broken apart, just like the belly breaks down the nutrients, the foods and fluids we consume. In the dream... The experiences we have during the day are processed. They are sifted through. They're digested. Some of them are excreted, meaning forgotten, and some of them are assimilated, meaning they're remembered. People who don't dream well lose their memories, specifically a certain type of memory we call procedural memory, which has to do with movement, motion, and emotion. So we know for a fact that if we don't dream well, the number one thing we're going to see in short order is clinical depression. I think dream loss is the single most critical overlooked cause of depression. Dreaming is an antidepressant, much better than any drug we have out there. So dreaming well helps us process information. If we don't dream well, we have a psychological constipation. You know, we're, we're not assimilating, we're not digesting daily life experiences, we're not getting nourished from daily life experiences. And if we continue not to dream well over time, it will profoundly negatively impact our memory, this memory loss. In fact, poor dreaming is associated ultimately with dementia and with Alzheimer's disease. I'm so glad that you brought this metaphor up. I, I think it's it's such a beautiful way to look at dreaming. I was wondering, had a quick question. Do you think that dreaming is the therapeutic aspect of sleep that kind of helped your parents to process their experiences as being Holocaust survivors? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. I appreciate your, your, your raising that. I think so. And um, it, it's interesting. Uh, my mother, from the time I was quite small, would talk to me about her dreams. And, and by the way, this is not unusual in many other cultures, in, in indigenous cultures. Um, you know, people routinely respect the dream. They they just have this intuitive understanding that it's important. In our world today, you know, most of the scientists and sleep specialists I know believe that dreaming is is um, unimportant. It's accidental. And um, there's a common, it, there are probably more people who believe dreaming is meaningless than ever before. Even in my profession, you know, psychologists were once known as doing dream interpretation as a routine part of therapy. There's been a dramatic decrease 
in psychologists' interest in dreaming, which I think is, is a really bad sign. In fact, the word dream today, one of the most common uses of the word dream is in the context of real estate. We, we the, the, the term the American dream refers to a house, which is an interesting <laughs> sleight of hand. You know, we've taken something that is so magnificent and we've reduced it to materialism. Wow, yeah. So so the other thing you asked about, you know, dreaming and health and dreaming and spirituality, I think when we begin to pay attention to our dreams, we have a direct experience. This is not an idea that we've read in a book or heard about, but we, we feel it. We have a direct experience that there's something inside of us that is grand, that is, is, is intelligent. There's something inside of us that's carrying us along. There's, there's a greater order inside of us, even if at times it frightens us and shakes up the ego. And I, I think what that does is it returns spirituality to the individual. Then we, we are less driven by the rules that, that may come from, from external religious beliefs that tend to be very political, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And we come to trust our hearts a lot more. So would you say that dreaming can help us make sense of our, our waking life to a degree? Oh, big time. I think I think dreaming is the context of waking life. And when we don't dream, we think waking is all there is. It reinforces wake centrism. Um, and dreaming, again, it, it's an experience. Um, Joe Campbell, a great psychologist, once said something very controversial. He said, you know, we're not really uh, looking for meaning. Everybody, and I, I'm not putting meaning down. We want to understand meaning. But he said what we're really looking for is the personal experience. It's the feeling of being alive when you know it in your heart. There are just some things that we just know and we don't need data to corroborate it. And when people dream, it puts them in touch with the roots of their own lives. And what if you don't remember your dreams? Is that that a potentially negative sign? Because I, I, I'm speaking from personal experience, I don't necessarily remember my dreams often. There are sometimes, in fact, recently I've had more vivid dreams, but I, I just don't remember my dreams often. And is that a potentially negative thing? Well, it, it depends. I think it's, it's helpful to remember dreams. What's most important is that we dream, and people are dreaming less and less for a number of reasons. One is um, we as a society, we as a world, we drink too much alcohol. I'm not a teetotaler. I enjoy a glass of wine here and there. <laughs> but the, the World Health Organization has said that, that excessive alcohol consumption is one of the top health problems globally. So, you know, the human beings are drinking much too much booze, number one. Um, number two, most psychiatric medications, in fact, all of the most commonly used psychiatric medications, we're talking about antidepressants, benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, commonly, commonly used drugs, significantly suppress REM sleep. And, and there's just a lot of unconsciousness about this. Other medications that are used um, as we get older, they have something we call anticholinergic properties, significantly suppress dreams. And the other thing is when we don't sleep enough, we lose our dreams. Um, the brain prioritizes sleep over dreams, just as the body prioritizes water or fluids over food. Um, if we're not getting, if we don't have enough hours devoted to rest at night, the brain will use most of those in sleep. We'll have not enough dream time. And by the way, if people awaken with an alarm clock, uh, be, since we do most of our dreaming as we head toward morning, they're always snipping off the end of their dreams. It's like being chased out of a movie theater in the last 10 minutes of the film. <laughs> you know, we're just being cut off. So there are lots of reasons people aren't dreaming. But I think what helps with this is, number one, just to think about it and to talk about it. L- let me also add something I think is important and controversial. I think most dream interpretation misses the mark. The vast majority of dream books, most dream books are what we call dream dictionaries. They tell you if, if you dream about an apple, you look it up under A and they'll say apple means reproduction. Yeah. Or sex, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you dream about a telephone pole, of course, that means, well, communication or phone sex. <laughs> um, so so th- th- those approaches suggest that the dream doesn't have personal meaning. It, it 
you know, like if you're astute, you can understand the, 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 the general meaning. And I think they're extremely misleading. Uh, more important than knowing the meaning of a dream is knowing that your dream is personally meaningful. It's, it's, this is about trusting oneself. So allowing your, yourself to have enough time to sleep and then being with the dreams. It's also uh, being with it means you have to breach the dream to waking. So um, if you have a, a bed partner, it's a politically correct term today, um, if your spouse or your partner, if they value dreaming, if they respect dreaming, then talk about your dreams. Don't jump into interpretation. Interpretation is secondary. Interpretation is usually about sort of pulling the, the dream out of the waters of sleep and, and, and dragging it into the waking world. Usually we're imposing waking world meaning on the dream, and that limits the dream. We can use the dream to expand our sense of what waking is about rather than constrain or constrict the dream and, and, and bring it into waking. So, but talking about your dreams, writing about your dreams, keeping a dream journal, um, going to a dream group. I, I routinely run dream groups uh, in both where I live in and Tucson at times. And uh, being able to share dreams. You know, you get together with a friend you don't see often over lunch. Don't just talk about what's going on in your life. Uh, talk about a dream too. Because when we share a dream, we're sharing something that's really intimate. It's so intimate, it shows up in symbolic fashion. It can't, it can't really be reduced to, to the, the, the hard mundanity of waking life. So it, it promotes intimacy. But only share your dreams with people who respect dreams. That's really important. Why is that? Because otherwise it can be, they can be kind of dismissed as trivial or meaningless? Exactly. They'll be dismissed. People will attempt to, to contain or dominate the dream by saying, oh, yeah, I know what that means. That's just because, you know, um, you didn't have lunch yesterday. <laughs> you know, they come up, the people come up with silly explanations. And that's really about controlling the dream. But we need to let the dream carry us. We need to let the dream guide us rather than imposing our waking ego beliefs upon the dream. So would you say there's no utility in dream interpretation or in, in like using a wake-centric view to kind of pr uh, process or uh, demystify the meaning of dreams? Or is there some place for that? No, it's not that there's no value in interpretation. I, I've been doing dream interpretation for decades. I, I'm trained in that. But I think rather than imposing a wake-centric uh, model on the dream, it's it's more of a collaboration. Yes, there are times when I'll dream about I'll have a dog in my dream because you know there I encountered a dog here and there. But um, so there's a connection, but we want it to be more of a conversation, a collaboration between the waking world meaning and the, the night dream experience. Uh, it's not about reducing the dream to a subset of waking. I, I actually believe waking is more of a subset of dreaming, but it, it, it's, it's a back and forth dialogue. Yes. Yeah, so the dream can teach us about waking. And, and by the way, you know, the, for those of us who work with dreams, uh, we can tell you unequivocally that a, a, a huge percentage of the population report having precognitive dreams. Many, many people have dreams, uh, the elements of which come true the next day, the next week, or the next year. And this is really hard for people. But when I have an audience, uh, and I'll say, how many of you have had dreams that have uh, you know, been precognitive or uh, uh, prophesied something? almost always at least half the hands go up. And people are reluctant to admit this. You know, they'll look around before they bring their hand up. But it, it's something that's really challenging to explain. And there are explanations that don't come so much from science, but come from religious or shamanic traditions, that the, that the dream is actually a more fundamental kind of life. So one of the explanations is, you know, that when we look up into the night sky and we see a constellation that's 100 light years away, we know we're seeing something that's not there anymore. It already happened. Yeah. By the time we become aware of it happening, it's gone. Um, my dream teacher taught us that nothing ever happens in the waking world until it's first happened in the dream world. So huh. like the dream is like a constellation or stars way up there. And waking is when they've arrived here. So by the time they've arrived here, they were like waking life has already happened. It's happened in the dream world. And we have a lot of choice 
we have less choice about changing it. We have some, but more choice about how we will interpret it, how we will relate to it. That's fascinating to me. And I'm just wondering if there's any way to prove that in a scientific context or if, there, if, we're, going, if we're ever going to be able to kind of produce a paper on that. Well, it's interesting. So one of my colleagues, uh, Gary Schwartz, who's a, a renowned uh, researcher and professor at, at the University of Arizona, um, has been doing research. And, and by the way, let me just emphasize, he is a hard-ass scientist. Mm. I mean, he is an incredibly well-respected researcher. Hundreds of, of scientific articles, a number of books published. Um, you know, Harvard, uh, director of the Yale Behavioral Health Clinic, and he's at Arizona. He's been doing research for some years in life after death, double blind research studies using psychics. I mean, this is fascinating stuff. And he has, in my mind, unequivocally proven the existence of consciousness outside of the body. Now, whether we want to call that a soul or something else, but there, there is data that there's information retrievable uh, about people's lives after they've passed on from people who know nothing about them. And again, he set up these walls, these, these uh, double blind walls. I'm making a very long story short. Uh, but yes, the science is beginning to, uh, to move into this. Um, th- there's a lot of tension within science because there's a generally a profound neglect of personal experience. And I think that's a problem. Um, there are actually some scientists who believe that consciousness doesn't exist. Which, which <laughs> is, is hard to be conscious about. Uh, but yeah, because it's called the hard problem in consciousness. Yeah. How do we explain, like you and I and everybody listening, we, we are aware, we're sentient, we have this awareness. And there are a lot of people trying to reduce that to the, the shenanigans of molecules. Um, and Gary's position and my belief is that, that the body and the brain are more like a channel. They're like a radio or a TV receptor. They channel consciousness. They don't produce it. Yeah, this is this is the edge of where science and, and spirituality are coming together today. Right. Yeah, no, that's fascinating stuff. D- Dr. Nyman, I know we're getting close on time here, so I want to ask you one, one final uh, wrap-up question here, which is really just open to kind of whatever message you want to communicate to our listeners. If you could kind of wrap up your, your message and the most important thing that you want to communicate, what would that be? Well, let, let me say two, two things. One, with regard to time, we know that time isn't really real, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, in the wake-centric world, and, 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 and here we are. I mean, we, 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 need, um, we, we need, to, need to straddle two worlds. We do need to have one foot solid in the waking world. This is not about being airy-fairy. We do. And waking is important. And at the same time, the, the, the basic message is, I think we need to reopen our hearts. I say reopen because I think as children, we were all so connected with the world of sleep and dreams. We need to reopen to that and to consider that it's not just the outer world. If I can share real quickly, you know, there's an interesting parallel. Uh, jo- Joseph Campbell, again, uh, one of his works was called The Inner Reaches of Outer Space. And he, he looked at the parallel between our inner world and our outer world. So there's a parallel between our relationship, our beliefs, uh, our fantasies, our fiction, our movies about outer space, and what we believe goes on deep inside. So I was speaking earlier about th- this common belief that we can't trust the unconscious, that what is deep inside of people can't be trusted. You know, it's the id, it's demonic. And so for many decades, uh, writing about outer space involved reflection of inner space. People thought aliens were going to come, Martians were going to come and, and, and uh, steal our women and children and eat us, you know. Uh, these terrible beings were coming down from outer space, these aliens. When, when um, even going back a number of decades, when Rollo May introduced this notion of the inner child, we, over time, we saw a shift. And uh, rather than seeing these monsters coming at us, aggressively from outer space, E.T. showed up. This image of a childlike uh, being with with great wisdom. So what we believe about what's deep inside is a reflection of or reflected in what we believe is what's on the outside. And uh, so let me finish up with one one of my favorite little anecdotes. Uh, It's about a newspaper reporter asking Albert Einstein what Einstein believed was the single most important question in life. 
thinking that Einstein would say something about the speed of light or gravity, Einstein said the most important question we can ask ourselves is, is the universe friendly? Is the universe friendly? And that's a question both about uh, the universe, the outer universe, the world itself, uh, um, the globe we live on, outer space. Uh, you know, clearly it doesn't always look very friendly, but despite its appearances, uh, its tragedies and beauties, is it friendly? And it includes the inner world. You know, my world of, of needs and hopes and desires, my world of dreams, uh, the, the losses I've experienced, the tragedies, the hopes, the beauties. So given all of that on the inside and the outside, is the universe friendly? And I think we all, whether we're conscious of it or not, we ask ourselves that question moment by moment. And how we're willing to answer it determines the quality of our lives. That, that is a profound question, and you can kind of dismiss it as, as a little bit airy-fairy at first, but uh, I'd like to know, just if you have a couple more minutes, why is that question so important? Is the universe friendly? And how does that, how do we unconsciously ask that question in, in our daily lives? Well, unconsciously, I, I think we ask it and we see a manifestation of the answer always. And the question is important because it will determine whether or not I will, my life will be a battle. And am I, you know, am I going to live with excessive ego defense, mistrust the world, look out for number one, uh, you know, fight everything around us, you know, uh, lead with judgment? Am, am I going to be in a battle with life or uh, am I going to collaborate with life? And I'm not talking about a, a, a submissive, just succumbing, you know, a yielding to everything. You know, we're alive. But the, the notion is to stay, to stay in a conversation with life, not to dismiss life itself, not to dismiss people as, as uh, experiences or beings that I have to be at war with, but to keep my heart open. Um, one of my teachers used to say the purpose of life was to learn to keep your heart open in hell. Because we, we do know that life is filled with tragedy. And it's also filled with beauty. So, you know, uh, Jung, Carl Jung wrote about what he called the pull of the opposites. And, you know, with every year that passes in my life, I, I am more and more blown away by how terrible it is. You know, I mean, it, I, what I've learned is if you can imagine something horrific, somebody has done it or is planning to do it. Yeah. I mean, there's such tragedy in life. And at the same time, how glorious and how unbelievably beautiful it is. It's both. Right. So this is what Jung called the pull of the opposites. There's a beautiful poem, um, a lyric from Bruce Coburn, where he talks about the pull of the opposites. He says, you see the extremes to which humans can be. And in that distance, tension is born with energy surging like a storm. You plunge your hand in and draw it back scorched but beneath it's shining like gold but better wow so it's about living in that 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 that's life um, that that pull and there's something beautiful in, within the heart of that tension and i guess i'm assuming the universe is frankly <laughs> <laughs> yeah it sounds like it amid all the the chaos there is order yeah yeah exactly well Dr. Nyman, I think that's a perfect place to, to leave off. I want to thank you for your time and, and for sharing your findings and your wisdom with us. I, I really appreciate it. Enjoy this conversation. Hope we can do it again sometime. That'd be great. I thank you. and I appreciate your questioning and, and uh, being tuned into this stuff. Thank you. Thanks for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode and all other episodes on my website at thinkgrowprosper.com slash podcast. That's where I put all the links and resources mentioned in each episode. It's also where I put the outlines of topics covered, which is a really good way to refer back to episodes in the future. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, I'd love to hear about it. Feel free to leave a review on iTunes with your biggest takeaway. I make it a point to read all the reviews. You can also screenshot this episode and share it to your social media along with something you learned or found interesting. And tag me in your post because I'd love to see what you found interesting. Say hi and thank you for your support.